I am unashamed. What about you? So, so today's is your last day to hunt. Last day. So I come in. Y'all aren't back yet. So I'm thinking, oh boy, they'll be singing the blues and the last day, and it'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. That's, you would think. That, that's what my expectation was when I came in here this morning. But instead, it was quite different. I was le- I levitated. <laughs> Into the podcast room, you did. So this is a long story because it's all relative. Uh, people that Ace, know, do you tell any other stories except long story? Uh, I don't know. Can you tell a short story? No, I don't like uh, short stories. In fact, if it's a book and it's a short story, I'm like, nah. <laughs> you can, I either it needs like a, a novella, it's either bumper sticker or a novel. That's right. <laughs> no in between. I like it. So the backstory on this is we go hunting. After the podcast yesterday, we only had one hour to hunt. Yep. But I was already down here. It was in the afternoon. The The place we went, no ducks are using. So it was, to say it was a long shot is an understatement. But old Burley wanted it to go. It was just you and Burl. Me and Burl, we go out there. And I said, you never know. So we go out there. No ducks are there. We put out a pretty good spread of decoys. And at five o'clock, which is just literally minutes before legal shooting hours is over. I look up and there's four mallards coming from the heavens out of the north. Just their wings are locked. I can tell they're coming. And I look behind them and there's 40 pintails. And for you non-duck hunters, pintails usually hang out in fields and uh, big agricultural and they're big out west. The, our listeners out in California, they're big out there. It's we have a lot of them common. in Louisiana, but where we specifically hunt, yeah. it is the rarest of duck. They say on the other side of the river, and I go crazy every year over pintails because there's they're something just beautiful and majestic about them, yep. the way they fly. They have an and, arc to their wings. The, yeah. It's really pretty. But you, you look up what a pintail drake looks like, and it is a thing of beauty. It is. Long neck. One of the reasons that I started getting interested in the creator, instead of this this happening out of nowhere, as Phil says, saltwater, was when I saw the pintail, a.k.a. the bull sprig, in flight. Yep. And I thought, no, somebody made that. And the reason they call him pintail, because he has one feather that is extremely long. How long is that feather, Phil? Four to six inches. Four, but I mean, if you pulled it out, I think it's longer than that. But it it, it sticks, sticks out, out about four inches. Yeah, it's like a rooster tail. Right. But it's on a it's on a. Which pencil. is why they call it the sprig, right? That's that's the idea. So yeah. back to the story. So I mean, I just go nuts when I see these ducks because it was so shocking. We didn't think we were going to see anything. I was like, yeah, get it, get it. It was just me and Burley. You know, <laughs> I'm shaking the string. And I was like, should I call? Should I not call? Should I call? Should? Because usually at this hole, if you call. They're, they're spooky about it. You know, if they're mm-hmm. coming, why blow a duck call? I mean, so I said, I'm not going to call. I said, let the four mallards light. Because I was convinced they were coming straight down. And, and then we'll get the pintails. So they come in front of us. They come straight over the back of the blind. The pintails were behind. And then it was like 15 seconds goes by, 30 seconds goes by. Because we're down expecting them to reappear. No, no reappearing. So then a minute goes by, and I'm like, what happened? He's like, I don't know. Well, then we look up, and he said, there they are. Well, it was just the pintails, but they were leaving, heading south, really low. So it's like they almost went down behind us. I said, well, what happened to the mallards? He said, I don't know. So it was depressing because I'm watching these pintails fall. Well, then we hear the mallards. Well, I get out of the blind and look around. Well, they they lit behind us. Mm -hmm. So I tried to, like, sneak up on them. That didn't work. They got up, and I killed one. So we, I shot one mallard drake. Pintails are gone. I mean, it wasn't a bad hunt. So, But I was like, and that's all we saw. So the reason I'm telling that story is because this morning, we're going, we're going to a completely different place. We had the decoys in the boat. There's four of us, me and Burl and Phil and uh, the nurse practitioner. The nurse, ma'am. And we're almost fixed to pull out, and I said, hey, Grab a rack of those pintail decoys because I saw a bunch of 40 yesterday. Famous last words. And I heard someone mutter, it wasn't me or Phil, 
uh, we hadn't seen a pintail over here in years. <laughs> <laughs> was, I said, grab. Was that you, Dad? <laughs> grab, no, it wasn't Phil. Some, one of the Burley or the okay. nurse man said that. I said, hey, grab the pintails. I took that as an insult. I just saw 40 <laughs> fly by yesterday. Of course you took it. So that. anyway, we... we <clears throat> Put the decoys out. We killed, a, you know, a few little scrap ducks, nothing much going on. And we had to leave at 9 o'clock to be here. And what was it, Phil? Like 8.30? At 8.30, I heard the nurse man say, pintails. And I look up, and there's four pintails fairly low. I mean, the sun was shining on them. The of course, I is- just look. After all this hype after yesterday, I, I got duck fever. I, started, I was nervous. I was shaking, you know. I was like holding my hand. I was like, dang, I'm shaking here. Checking your and pulse. So I was like, should I call? I, I did the same process. <laughs> but since they didn't come in yesterday, I tapped them a lick, just a little hand call, mm-hmm. and they locked. Phil saw it. They just locked and turned. And I thought, there, it's happening. <laughs> And so when they come around, I said, let's shoot them over the back of the blind. Because I was just trying to kill one. Yeah. We do not kill pintails in the woods. Because you're never thinking, get them yeah. in the decoy. And so, but when they came over, they were all on my side. I'd have been the only one to shoot. It was through the trees. And Lines so, like this, the ducks are coming like this. They were coming over the back of the blind. Opening it out there. And they just, he wanted to kind of shoot them right here. Yeah. I did. But. Because I didn't think they were coming. wisely yeah. by just letting them go out there. So so they come over and I tapped them again, can't can't. And when I did, they just sat down in the air and just started backpedaling Backpedaling. toward the decoys. They got about halfway down, and I said, "Kill them!" But when I raised up, they just kept coming down. Ooh! Oh, and they got closer. That's when you know it's over. Closer, and we just all four of them. Just, and it's perfect. You got four men, you got four pintails. You can only, you can shoot, only shoot one, one pintail, pintail a piece. Yep. So we all Everybody's shot legal. our one pintail a piece legally. And then I I thought, this is a woohoo move. I didn't say woohoo. I thought about it. And I thought. <laughs> but you weren't filming. You could have done it. Well, no, I did it. I started <laughs> woohooing because usually we act like we've been there before. But guess what? We haven't been there in so long. I thought this is a woohoo moment. And so then we took pictures for 20 minutes, and one of the pintails had a double sprig, which is rare. Oh, yeah, I don't think that was very rare. So he had two of the long feathers. Double sprig. I mean, if I'd have been. I think been, they only get the two with age. Is that what it is? You've been around a while. Well, I learned something new. I didn't even you know are, you, You're kind of a double sprig now, Dad. That's kind of your MO. Yeah, I got double sprigs, all right. <laughs> So I got I got back aches on both sides of the back. <laughs> oh, it was that. So I said I'm good. I turned around to the blind. I said I'm good because they're like, well, this is your last day because we I got to go film. Yeah, you're this working week. the rest of the week. Yeah. Uh, rest of the week. That's why I it was the prettiest sight I've seen this year. Oh, it was the prettiest sight I've seen in the last two years because yep. last year was a struggle. Yep. It was. Awesome. Well, you know what it was, Jay. You you've been you've put in the time, you've worked hard. It hadn't been the best two seasons. You've been you got a new show. You got podcasts we're doing, and the Almighty blessed you. I really believe that. With the closing act and Burley, your favorite duck, and the perfect number. Yep. And it, they worked perfectly. Look, Burley had the greatest explanation to what happened yesterday that I've ever heard, and he said, "Hey, Jay, you know how Burley is." I said, yeah. He said, do you know why we didn't get the 40 pintails yesterday? And I thought he was going to say something from a duck technical analysis form. I was looking at the decoys, and I said, why? He said, because the Lord does not give you more than you can bear. (laughs) He said, look, when when you're in temptation, there's always an open door. There's always a way out. And he said, the Lord knew. The only way out of this (laughs) is for me to direct their flight south. (laughs) Those those ducks had to go to Catahoula Lake. And when I thought about it, I thought, you know what? He's right. If 40 pintails would have came in there yesterday. and The law would have been broken. I only can shoot one of these. (laughs) And I thought, Burley, you're right. Why was I frustrated that that happened? And then the next day, we, we, the next day. 
Here comes four. Now, you might call this coincidence, but I'm leaning toward it. It just happened to be four of us, and they came in. It was the last day. I mean, it was a storybook in it. It didn't happen right before the podcast. And then I thought, I thought, you know, I wish we'd have had a cameraman for that. But then I thought, what am I saying? If we'd have had a cameraman, they'd have flared off the camera. Exactly. We would, it wouldn't have happened. And you couldn't have done a woohoo because you'd have tried to be acting all Joe Cool about the whole thing. I actually took footage of it in my mind. That's right. Which you can never erase that. Yep. Unerased. Now, your audience today, when they've heard that story, what they're thinking is they. It, it, this is really a big deal with them. Well, it's the... It, I, now they're thinking, what is wrong with these I people? I said it was that's a long they... story because, look, <laughs> you reach a point in duck hunting where you're looking at the greatest challenge. And the, I've concluded the greatest challenge in duck hunting is to shoot ducks where there are no ducks. So we Which take the ducks. borderline stupid. And but, Burl said, let's see now. Well, let, me, let me see. Onions, bell pepper, celery, garlic. He said, I'm trying to get to what, what, how much flour cooking oil. So from those ducks, they will now go, there will be a, gumbo? a duck gumbo. Mm -hmm. You can get three days out of it. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's, it's a big pot, big pot. Yep. So, so in you the, boil in your way, ducks to get the broth, mm -hmm. and we only take the backs and the legs mm -hmm. for, the, for the meat inside the gumbo. Right. Not, we're also taking the, the spirit of the pintail, Phil. The as spirit. Even on, the as the top spirit. of the food chain. Yeah, you add in a little shit. They shrimp. are a beautiful bird. Yes. And it was exciting. It's like that wood duck on the wall there, just the color code on him. I mean, there is more design, artistic design, just look at that wood duck owl right there. I know it. So we have a lot of wood ducks and mallards, and we shoot. And look, it's just it's it's really James Ford here. You you want something you can't have, and so because other people every time I go crazy about pintails, I mean they're like, well, well we got thousands of them. Yeah, you know, nope. what what? I was like, <laughs> they're shooting them like doves. We don't have them, and to convince those pintails to come down into a hardwood timber hole, which is not in their nature. Their nature is to go way out that's, into that's a correct. big field. The reason I we had those pintail decoys though, I'm convinced they looked down and thought, well, hey, yeah. they would not have come in there without yeah. those decoys. Well, there's some pintail. Good there's call. Our species. Didn't you write a book one time? Good call. Good call. That was a good one. Thanks for plugging my book. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> we didn't even have Zach here for the shameless plug. <laughs> Dad did it today. Good Zach time. had to take uh, he had to take a couple podcasts off because he said the tire tracks that I was putting on him <laughs> was more than he could bear. He had it. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We we our family loves to argue. We usually don't do it just because you know some people find that offensive. Yeah. Uh, but our family, we really find it quite exhilarating, and we test our arguments. Yeah. So uh, for, for those that, that were in on the bonus footage. Yeah, we had a couple day. of bonus uh, uh, footages ago in the overtime. It was an epic. I felt like, I don't know how Dad <laughs> felt, but I always felt like I was watching a really good tennis match. Well, look. And back you, and forth between Jason. and Since Zach. I don't do social media, look, y'all go to social media and tell Zach he won. Just make him feel better, because I am comfortable in my position, and I'm pretty sure that he's wrong. So go ahead and brag on him, because we don't want to burst the bubble. <laughs> so he took a little time off to nurse his, nurse his wound. So because Zach is not here today, we have brought in one of our favorite uh, people, our, uh, our unashamed contributor, one Mr. Larry Bowles from Oklahoma. He is my favorite uh, Oki from near Muskogee. Uh, Oklahoma. So we're, we're going to take a break. When we come back on the other side, we'll have Larry join us and we're going to talk about his sermon yesterday, which was fantastic. So we'll see you on the other side. Break. All right. Welcome back to Unashamed. We got our old friend Larry Bowles. Hey there. Welcome back to the Lair. It is wonderful to be back. So, Larry, so I'm finally here uh -huh. and you're here. Yeah. It's been kind of a rarity. It has. Because you were like, I show well, up and you leave. Right. right? And, and you're and you're like, well, I, I want to see you. I'm about, I'm about let, yeah, Larry, you're right, my yeah. replacement. So that's that's why when you're here, I can go somewhere else. I know that's, it. I know it. I said, this is how it's going to be. I show up <laughs> and you just take off. So. Yeah, I'll replace anyway. No, it's good to be. I'm used to sitting in jail. Jace's chair, and he's there. And when I sit in Jace's chair, I tend to talk a you little. Tell more. longer stories. I do. Yeah. It's I do. the chair. Al. It's, it's the, the chair. chair. It's yeah. not Jace. It's the chair. It's, it's I blame the chair. A little bit yeah. long-winded. <laughs> no, Larry, we always love having you. Um, you're a great preacher. 
and you get to preach at our church, which is a blessing. And a funny storyteller, because when he overheard me telling the Pentel saga, and he said, where was you at, South was, America? Uh, Costa Rica. Yeah. Costa Rica. And he was like, they, he said he heard this loud wreck, and people were like, come look at this. You're not going to believe this. And they go over there, and you went over there, and what was it? It was an armadillo. <laughs> It was an armadillo. Right. Okay. They're, they're rare. The guy from so, Oklahoma, you've seen a few armadillos. Yeah, right? we, we, we hit them with our cars at, you know, accidentally and <laughs> right. stuff. But I guess it's a rare thing. It's kind of like a pintail here. It's That's not it. rare in other places, but it's rare to you. So, so you Larry, got the meaning of the story. I did. So tell, <laughs> us, uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, before we get into all of our Bible stuff, tell us a little bit about what's going on in Greece. I know you've been, yeah. since you've been on the show, you've been at least one time, I guess, huh? Since the last time you yes, did the podcast, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about what's happening over there, how things are going. Uh, people love are your going work. great. Uh, again, you know the the pandemic changed everything. Um, <coughs> what the ministry that used to happen in Athens is now kind of happening from Athens, and we had always done uh, video discipleship ministry and that sort of thing, and we'd had you know two or three hundred videos, and then the pandemic shut all the travel down, so that kind of mm just threw gas on the fire of, of that video production. And ever since that has happened, uh, we're reaching people in different places like never before. And this is even within uh, Afghanistan and Iran. And so the last time I was down there, I was on Lesbos Island, which Athens is kind of the lobby of that refugee flow. Well, Lesbos is kind of the front door. <clears throat> and uh, so this guy comes into the room and he says, I know you. And I said, well, you just got here, and I don't think we've ever met. And he said, no, I know you from the video in Afghanistan. Oh, and so that's where that. I first had about heard about Jesus. So oh, wow. this is getting into Iran, and we now have about six or eight uh, underground kind of churches there that are, are just as a result of, of the videos that are mm -hmm. slipping in there. Uh, and we've been able to get some of it on um, – satellite because Iran, most people don't know, is internet dark. It's a little bit like North Korea. Uh, Afghanistan's mm. not. It's wide open. Um, but yeah. uh, anyway, it's the Lord is doing things <clears throat> in places that is just amazing. And I've always said, if you know, if we'll get out of the way, uh, what he can do in spite of us and through us is... is, uh, is so when I preached there, was that... That was... Because I was, it went into Iran. That was, somewhere. that was, what you said was simulcast. Yeah, so uh, somebody may know me in Iran from seeing the video. Yeah, here. and yeah. it is, well, I, they absolutely do. Uh, it is also in our video archives, and you can, oh, okay. you can go to acrocenter.org and pull it up. Well, did you go back to the restaurant we went? Uh, at, I have been once, yeah. yeah. Well, the guy who interpreted for me, yeah, he sent me a picture the other day, and That's him and his wife. Yeah. yeah, they were at that <laughs> at, at the that, same place. I said, um, I think I've started a tradition here. Yeah, you know, I but, don't know. Yeah, it, I, I, we were privileged to have you and Missy come and it, to try to get Jace something to eat in the city of Athens. It's only a city of you know six million, but we had to narrow it down to oh, this very, one. He's very one picky. Spot. I one concluded spot. that I would have been. It would have been good to eat there about two thousand years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. I said, let's get out of this city. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and we, we found the perfect a place. South there. Yeah, it was, it's wonderful. Yeah, I told it's that wonderful. story before, but it was so awesome. Well, people that, mistake. They look at the Robertson family and they mm -hmm. see the way everybody looks and they think, oh, you could, these guys eat roadkill. They eat anything. But you don't realize how picky. Oh yeah, this group is about food and game and like I found that out. You know, because yeah, once I, you host us, I, you know. I had the same misconception. <laughs> I'm a food then, yeah. star, but I mean, not roadkill depends on if I if I was created the roadkill. Well, true. So I'm, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. I'm way more nervous over potluck casseroles that people yeah. throw together. Well, we you, were we take, were trained for that. They right. take the stuff that they were yeah. going to throw out throw it all together and yeah. take it to a church building and say potluck. Right. But if you shoot it and you clean it, and exactly. you know exactly what you got and where it came from. You know why I like that place? Why? Because he brought out a platter and there was three or four fish mm -hmm. that they yeah. had just caught. Yeah. And he said, which you one you want? Your fish, I'm right. like, no, this is my kind of restaurant here. Right. Here, this is what we call. And I was like, I want that one. I think well, the, I the guy heard. came up and he held it in front of him and he flipped the gill up on that fish. He, he did, did look that. at it and so he was fresh. That's when he was 
He yeah. had him. He had him hooked and flopping on the dock. Oh, I was. Time. It was fantastic. Yeah. So I did that. I didn't tell you this, Larry. When we were in Greece um, last summer, and we missed each other because you were in the mm-hmm. states, and uh, so we <laughs> ate at a restaurant. Same thing. They brought the fish out. So we were having lunch, and so they showed the fish, and so Lisa and I were going to split it. But I looked at the menu. And it was whatever euros, you know. And so right. I thought, oh, okay, you know, it's for lunch. It was going to be like, you know, 30 bucks or whatever, right. you know, when, once you did the thing. Well, I didn't realize it was that many euros per gram of fish. Right. So we eat our lunch. It's delicious. The fish was great. They come out and they bring the bill. And there's four of us. And so I grabbed the check, you know, and I look down there and it's, you know, $300 for lunch. Yeah. I thought, I'm looking around. I thought, man. Did somebody get something, you know, <laughs> yeah. full of gold or something? Right, right. And so then I look at our fish. That fish was $120. Right. Because it was by the gram. Right. But I didn't, re- I, you know, I wasn't picking up on the language there. I was right. having a language it's issue. A, it's a little bit like when you go and get a lobster in America. It's market price. Exactly. And so. Yeah. I found out the hard way with a yeah. nice $300 <laughs> left. But I think the fact that it was fresh fish, Al, would it was delicious. I have qualify to as priceless. <laughs> yeah. Was it baked, broiled, or Yep. They just it was grilled the one I had. whole thing. Yeah, they grilled the whole thing. Yeah, brought the whole fish out there. And then did he 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 clean, he filleted it for you, didn't he? No, he, he, he did just, not. Mine okay. was okay. completely the okay. whole fish. Yeah, they they Cooked tell you the guts. they will yeah. stand at your table and actually he deboned. You know, he, he, he offered it. that yeah. to me, and I said I'll do it myself. Yeah, of course you just did. cook it, and it was fantastic. Mm-hmm. It was yeah. fantastic. And I tell you what, I lo- fell in love with there was the. The, the deal with the meat spit rolling around and them shaving the mm-hmm. meat off right. with the white it's, sauce. It's called it. a, a gyro. Uh-huh. And you know why it's called a gyro? The I, word comes I, from gyroscope, that idea of it oh, spinning. Yeah. So there's one flame source, and then they peel that off. So everything has got that nice, crispy. It's got that crispy, <laughs> outside it's juicy. Like yeah. nice, crispy bacon kind of thing. Yeah. Was it better than an op? No, that's don't go crazy. But it was it was really I mean I was it was fantastic. It was not as good as a crappie or an op, but it was right below it. It was delicious. It was in the top five fish a that white, I ate. Flaky this fish. was a grouper. Yeah, yeah, that's what I had too. Yeah, white flaky yeah. fish. I love I love the flow of the conversation we got from you know. Well, you well, can look, tell. Yeah. We uh, we were we're fishers of men, but we're also <laughs> fishermen. <laughs> And we're fishing. So, yeah. Look, but you got to realize for me, I don't <laughs> like big cities. I'm claustrophobic. We yeah. were doing that you were, for the you Lord. You were not in your natural environment. And there. When, but when I got out there, mm-hmm. I loved it. You're I, good. So You're I good. would, if I ever uh, would go back, I would eat there every day. Right. We'd be on a first name basis. They'd yeah. bring oh, out yeah. the platter. And yeah. I just, they'd, they'd probably have a dish named after you. Or ride something. the winners. Yeah. yeah. Ride right. the winner. It was a winner. So I want to say, uh, so everybody will know, acrocenter.org, you mentioned, if mm-hmm. you want to see what Larry's doing, or onekingdom.org, which is our connection to Larry. Yeah. So if you want to check out his work, uh, and it's amazing work but that we're a part of, uh, be sure and do that. So let's take a break. So we're in First uh, Peter, and uh, I wanted, before we get into the, the text um, that you preached yesterday, Larry, because your sermon was so good. And, oh, and I took you. I took a page of notes that oh. we're going to be uh, working for. I have a very copious. Uh, you note-taker. are a copious note taker. Um, notice that we're going to. But I wanted. I, I'm sure you do a little bit of background, I, and I love your background stuff. And we kind of we kind of already did an intro to the book when we preached the series. But right. what what is your take on just the setting of it? Uh, we talked a lot about on the podcast about Peter's sort of role as the impetuous, you know like foot in mouth and yet the right. same time fantastic guy right. that went through that three year discipleship, you know, program with Jesus. So we talked a lot about his character and even the idea of him being a fisherman. Right. And sort of how that shaped him. But what's your kind of your take of him as a man and then also the setting for the book? I mean, well, cuz I, I knew you thought about it when oh, you Oh, absolutely. Get into it. Absolutely. I, I being <laughs> being a retired fireman, I had always seen Peter in a, in perhaps a different light because Given the choice between being a fisherman or a fireman, Peter absolutely would have been a fireman, I think. Because firemen, you have to look at them and explain things, not once, not twice, but three times. You know what I mean? And uh, he just, I, I, um, everything is uh, 
in his life up to that point, he was going to fix it. And, and, and Phil and I were talking about this before we came on air. The idea that he's going to do everything is, is like, you know, Jesus is like, we're going to Jerusalem. Everything is going to be fulfilled. I'm going to be handed over and I'm going to be crucified, you know, and I'll be raised on the third day. <laughs> and Phil made the point, Peter's like adamant that in Matthew is like, no, that's not happening. Not on my watch. It's not happening. <laughs> And and he was such a fix it in the flesh kind of guy. Here's Jesus in the garden, and and here comes Judas and betrays him, kisses him on the cheek, and they're gonna arrest Jesus. And Peter's like, Oh no, no, I'm gonna cut this guy's ear plumb off, you know. And that's that is so him. Um, and I made the point in the sermon yesterday that. That coming to a relationship with Jesus does not. We don't make disciples at the at the at Acro Center by by a transfer of information. We it, it is absolutely the revelation uh, of who Christ is in you. Mm-hmm. Can you tell how long it was? Oh, between uh, the three year span with Jesus, right? Then the the Book of Acts talks about Peter getting. Right. He's the one that gave the. Open the door to the kingdom. Yeah. Well, so you how long was it days. before he sat down and wrote First and Second Peter? Roughly. Oh my goodness! It was late in 30, his, at least thirty years. At least thirty years. Yeah. And, and this and is this thirty is what, years later. Right. What a change in a man. Well, and, and what it is is a shift in his mission. And and we're talking about that while ago. Uh-huh. I mean, it used to happen in Athens. Now it's happening from Athens, and and that sort of thing. He was set out to be. Uh, a, a missionary to Jews, to, to you know, the, the Messianic community, um, proving that Christ is the Messiah. And that's what he even says, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of God, this proclamation, who do you say that I am? Um, Jesus even told him, what kind of death he would exactly? I mean, yeah. So he's getting the full. Yeah, load. you're going to be led around, and you're going to you're going to do this way. Yeah. Um, but this is very late in his ministry because now, if you see the first ten chapters or so of the book of Acts, this is all Peter's doing is dealing with with the Jewish community. Right. Mm-hmm. And then there's a shift, uh, and Jesus is like, "No, your mission now is going to change." And that's right. a little bit like you know what we've experienced in our mission. It's like I'm going to do this, and he's like, "No, you're going that way." And yeah. it's a little bit like riding a <laughs> surfboard in a tsunami. You're just you're going with uh, the way that he's leading. You know, it kind of seems strange when you read about him. Uh, the the people got riled up at him, the Jews, uh-huh. because he was ordinary and unschooled. Right. Remember that? Yeah. Which means... Yeah, oh, Peter and guy, John, ordinary, guy, unschooled what? men. Actually, yeah. in the Latin Vulgate, the word is idiote. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> common, they're common idiots. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So the leaders yeah. of the Jewish people at that time, they were like, where in the world did they right. come up with this? Right. That's I Acts can see 4, how they were like... It's Acts yeah. 4.13 where it says that. Yeah, exactly. And so this is, this is very, very late. This is... Um, just almost, yeah, I'd say at least 30 years. And then Second Peter is actually his last, it's a farewell. It's been revealed to him that he is going to die. Yep. Jesus has told him how he's going to die. And yep. so it's, it's almost a sign off. But all of this, the, the people that he lists here in, in verse 1 of uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, all of these are, you know, in, in these, uh, this is very similar to the seven churches of Asia. All of these places are in what is now modern Turkey. So this is, yep. our, this is our folks. Uh, yep. uh, same idea. <clears throat> and they are now coming out of a pagan society, and he is trying to get them to understand that this, you cannot follow Jesus through religion. Right. Uh, this is not about. This is not the Christian religion, and right. this is going to be the life of Christ in you made manifest to the point that you're going to live in a uh, in a non-combative example. Uh, you know, it, I mean, all of all of these instructions and everything, it's not an idea that I'm going to live in opposition to the society that I'm in, but I'm going to 
I'm going to be salt and light. I'm going to be a city on a hill. I'm going to be uh, the life of Christ, the hands and feet of Jesus in this. Right. And so I'm going to submit to the the authorities that I have no ability to to undo. Right. Uh, it's very much like the idea of of Jesus saying, you know, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Right. You know, that's not your fight. Your fight is to believe in me. Uh, and so. <clears throat> Which is yeah, and it you're exactly right. And what I you know what's interesting is if you look back at Acts ten, you know, and Acts nine, whenever Paul, when Saul is called to let her be Paul, mm-hmm. he's told you're gonna be my envoy to the Gentiles, which right. he was. Right. But it's interesting that I assume, and and you may agree or disagree, it was for credibility's sake, he sends Peter to Cornelius. Right. Not Paul. Right. But Peter, because right. he's established, he's the leader. He's the you know he's the guy who you know preached that first sermon. He's the guy for whatever ten years has been doing it mm-hmm. in the in the Messianic community in the Jewish community. So he's the guy that's going to be there when the Holy Spirit falls on those first Gentiles. That's exactly right. And and it's for credibility, right? I mean, to open that door. I, I think so, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that you know um, that Robert Abels is with One Kingdom and I were having a conversation the other day, and we're talking about these divine appointments and Mm -hmm. how things we think just happen in a process. But, I mean, he sets up meetings between people that establish credibility, like you're saying, that open doors, that uh, open ears and open hearts uh, to a degree that that others really, really can't. And so, so he, and it's all part of him working all things together for good, for his purposes, for his glory. That's right. You were one of those divine appointments for us. Oh, well, and I you mean, guys were. were first time me. I heard you, I was like, who is this guy? I get out my notepad and start taking <laughs> notes. I was like, I've never heard anybody talking about the deity of Jesus. This is good. I look over at Jason. Jason's looking at me like, who is this guy? <laughs> I think thing. I said, hire him. <laughs> <laughs> that's what, I said. That's what but you, said. you're not saying that now. So you say, oh, that's the thing. Yeah. Well, you're uh, here. He's like, yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> let's take another break. So before we get to verse uh, 13, because we've already done three through 12, but, okay. I, but I want to talk to you a little bit about it. Yeah. Um, just as a lead up, because you really never do it anyway. So, I mean, I heard his lesson yesterday, right? And it was in the same vein. No, it was it was right where we were. It was really yeah. good because it made me feel good about what we've been talking about. But it, we said if you were to come to the verse mm-hmm. where you started yesterday, be holy because I'm yeah. Verse six. The intimidating. Yeah, that's concept. what makes you cringe in the text. Exactly. But yeah, it, you think I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, I, yeah. You, you mentioned the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. Yesterday, but the first time I remember as a new Christian, I remember reading the Sermon on the Mount at the end where he says, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Mm-hmm. And I thought, Well, I'm out on that. I, I, I can't. There's no way right. I can do this. Right. That must mean something else. Or, right. so, you know, I, I just was having trouble yeah, wrapping my it, head it around it. It doesn't mean anything else. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a restatement of the same idea that yeah. comes from Leviticus 11 19. Yeah, which is yeah. really rich. So, yeah. so let's talk about that. Just your first impression when people who read this and are thinking, well, how does this work? How, how are you. How am I supposed to be holy because he's holy? And I thought this was all, you know, dependent on yeah. him and not me. Well, well, that's that's what goes back to the idea is that that's what all religion seeks to do. It seeks I seek to make myself holy by external forces. Mm-hmm. Um, and I use the example of John 15 um, is that, you know, Jesus says, I'm the vine and you're the branch. I'm going to be the life source and you're going to be a branch. And I don't want you to be anything more than a branch or anything less than a branch. You just be a branch. And your one job is to abide in me. Mm. And so if you've got this branch and it is abiding in that vine and it has that life source, so it has life in it. But what is it that makes that branch grow and throughout a growing season bear fruit and flourish? It's sunlight, wind, and rain. Mm-hmm. Okay, and if it doesn't have those, it doesn't it doesn't do that. <clears throat> and so those are external forces acting on the life source that's in it. You cut that branch off, and you cut the life source out, 
and now it's no longer good for anything except to be thrown in a fire and burn. Mm-hmm. What is it that breaks that into dust? Sunlight, wind, and rain. The exact same external forces in the world. Yeah. Um, the one with life flourishes. The one without life is broken down and destroyed. Mm. And yeah. so this is the idea that we're always trying to fix ourselves from the outside in yeah. with more knowledge, that next piece of information, you know, uh, that same level, whatever I do in the in the power of my strength really only makes my, my flesh more hostile and resistant to God. Yeah, exactly. And don't you think that's what you hear, Larry, when you hear people say, they say well, you know, yeah, I'm struggling. I, I, I need to do better. And and uh, I, I need to start, you know, going to church or and, get and read, back and read my Bible. I need to get back in church, read my right. Bible more. Yeah. And I, I need to, you know, pray more. They start giving you the list, of, mm-hmm. and all those are good things. Oh, they're great mm-hmm. things. But they're giving you the list of things they can do without ever saying, you know what? I need to. I need to find Jesus quickly right? and either reintroduce myself to him right. or find out why I never don't have a relationship. I mean, instead of the relationship aspect, it's the, usually the, the tenets. The life aspect I'm looking for. And so every everything that we do, we, we hear people talk about imitating Christ, be imitators of Christ. Mm. And we take that idea and we take it for a touchdown. And you know, look at curriculums that are written for Bible classes and stuff. There's 12 weeks, so we'll do 12 things. Well, Jesus you know, studied a lot. So you study a lot. He prayed a lot. You pray a lot. And you get to the end of the 12 weeks and it's like, great, now you can do that. Well, Mm -hmm. if you could do that, you could be Jesus. Yeah. You know? (laughs) What do you need him for? He wouldn't have had to come. But you're right. I mean, the true definition of... uh... of all that is that you can't do this. Exactly. And I made the point in the sermon is that Jesus didn't come to show us what we could do. He came to show us what we could not do. Yeah. That's how he fulfilled the law. Right. Yeah. And none of that is not one cross of the T or dot of the I is going away until heaven is earth it is over. Right. The spirit of religion and independence from God and self effort is as alive and well as it's ever oh, been. Yeah. Even was... though that's all been nailed to the cross, yeah. we still want to save ourselves. And yeah. so it's helped me. Right. Yeah. Don't you think it's ironic? The only time religion is mentioned mm. in James he says, you know, he talks about keeping a tight rein on your tongue in chapter one, but then he says, uh, true religion that God accepts as, as pure and faultless is taking care of widows and orphans. And when you think about it, he used an example of two, two groups of people who are pretty much dependent on someone else, mm-hmm. which I found that to go in with what you said, because really religion is, you know, imitation Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5 you know it's like be imitators of Christ and we'll bang you over the head if you're not but uh, I just find that ironic that's the only place it's mentioned and it's most time when you think religion you go into some big cathedral you know and you feel like you have to bring something to the table as far as your morality and your theology and maybe somehow you will arrive at the end of your day. You mentioned that, but if you take that idea of taking care of those who can't take care of themselves, and then you go back to the Levitical law Mm. that that Peter's drawing this from, from Leviticus 11, Leviticus 19, be holy as I am holy, all of these Levitical commandments were given. It's like you can harvest your field, but don't harvest the the perimeter of it. You leave that for the... For the widows and orphans. Well, right. And, well, and my so, point was, though, I yeah. was just saying, like, a baby, which the illustration here of, of right. the new birth uh-huh. is in, in us participating in Jesus. If we're born again and he's making that illustration, well, I know one thing from a baby because I've been around a lot of them, and we yeah. talked about this on the last podcast. They are totally dependent Oh yeah, on someone else. Exactly. That was my point. It's like— yeah. You're going to find that the key thing that people are looking for is when you give God everything, right? when you're totally dependent on him, well, that that's a synonym for being born again. Right. Because all of a sudden you, you've realized, oh, I can't, I don't have the accolades. I don't have the success. I don't have the strength. Yeah. But it's very hard to do. That's why I said it. I just thought it's interesting. He used that analogy on true religion because I think he was yeah. taking people that we view as I don't know, not that uh, 
strong or, you know, that right. it, we're looking at them like, well, why would he even right. say that, you know? Let's take our last break. You framed it from Matthew 10 when you talked about that we have to die and, <laughs> and be resurrected right. in his life, right? That's exactly. kind of how you framed he that. Said, what you know, whoever does not deny themselves, take up their cross mm-hmm. and follow me is not worthy to follow me. Right. Yeah. And we're like, well, wait a minute, because everybody, the world's trying to figure out if Jesus is worthy. Yeah. You know, is he worthy of my time? Is he worthy of my attention? And he's like, no, no, no. This is, you're, what you're doing is you're asking me to follow you. And and Jesus says, it doesn't work that way. You need to follow me. <laughs> yeah. And, and, Which is what Peter's whole problem yeah. was when he said, hey, if, I, if they all... Turn away. I never will. Right. I'm better than them. I'll if I that, have to go to prison with you, if I, I, gotta, I have to die. If I got to get a sword and cut that guy's ear off, I'm going to do it. Three you hours know, later, I don't know the man. Yeah, exactly. He's terrible. Yeah. And that was that was my, the point I made is like, you know, everybody's like education's just got to be the key to everything. Yeah. Well, what did, what did the disciples gain? Jesus taught them every day. They saw every miracle for three solid years. Where did it end? They all d- deserted him. Yeah, when things got tough, they all denied him. They all hid themselves away, um, because me being a disciple of Christ involves participating in His death and being moved through His resurrection yeah. and into His life, so that His life is made manifest yeah. in us. That it, doesn't come through education. No, that comes. This is the revelation of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Yeah, the world says that that this scripture is is a bunch of rules that is imposed upon humanity. Not at all. Mm. Yeah. What I see happening in the world around us and everywhere, all of this is just simply being exposed in every person that I'm looking at. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if I have to if I have to prove that this is true, then it's not truth at all. Because this is truth and life. It yeah. is written into us. And yeah. if you go against the teachings of God, you are going to suffer the consequences. Yeah. It's just, so it's if just, I, if it's going to happen. It's inevitable. Yeah. If I don't follow the rules of some religion, like I don't, I don't follow Buddhism. And so whatever Confucius has said, I've, I don't think I've ever obeyed. And I don't believe I've ever suffered the consequences for not obeying his commandments. Hmm. But you go and and disobey the commandments of of the one, you know, whose words are spirit and life and are written into our very fabric of our DNA because mm. he created us. All of this is on the hard drive. I love I love what you said that that the Sermon on the Mount was hardwired into the DNA. It is. It's written into our fabric. It's right. not. It's not a sermon. Whether you've on heard the it or not, whether you've read right. it or not, right. it's there. It is. And I if I that. if I see, if you hear it. Being spoken in these red letters that Jesus is yeah. bringing to you, it's that truth testifying to the truth that is written into you. And Jesus says it. Um, he says that you diligently study these scriptures, right. and you think that by them you possess mm-hmm. eternal life. You don't. You these are it. the scriptures that testify about me, and you refuse. Mm-hmm. You detach from that vine, you refuse to come to me to have life. Mm. And you're tr- doing sunlight, wind, and rain, and you're just beating yourself to death. And yeah. it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn you into the rest. <clears throat> when Jason and I were in school, Larry, they, they used to talk about the sacred cows. Mm-hmm. You could, they, the instructors used to joke that you could, you could hear in the background the, the lowing of the killing of the sacred cows. Well, you have to explain that. Most people are not <laughs> going. So it's like a teaching that you came up with or that you believe. You, you've heard or you yeah. brought into school with you. And yeah. so it's not, their job was to slay them. Yeah, that's yeah. not necessarily correct, you know. Or it, but it, but it, yeah. to the, in their defense, it was a lot of what we believe. Uh, you were taught that way. Even he referred Peter that when, when he said the— uh, was that the empty way uh, that was handed down to you from yeah. your ancestors? Uh-huh. What where, you inherited. Yeah, mm-hmm. well, where was that at? That's in... That's in 13 through 21. I'll yeah. On it. But it's like he addressed that. Yeah, yeah, it's in verse 18. Right. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers. So right. I was. it made me think of that. The sacred cows usually are... 
you being raised a certain way and taught a certain way that is not in line with the gospel. So we would joke with each other when you say, mm, like, yeah. okay. So, but, so you, you slayed a sacred cow for a lot of people <laughs> in, in your sermon. I want you to mention it on the okay. podcast before we get to overtime because it's so popular. And I was so glad you mentioned it because it's, it's one of those things that bugs me. So Philippians 4.13, oh, man. Yeah. Which, is, which is everywhere. Uh-huh. I can do mm-hmm. all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so you mentioned yeah. this in locker rooms. And oh, it's on it, every, it's We're going to win this football game touchdown. because of Jesus. Yeah. That's right. So I can do this. That's a sacred cow, right? It and, is. and it goes to this concept that I can do it. Right. And so t- tell what you said in your sermon, because I agree with you 100%, the context of what Paul meant when he wrote that. Has nothing, has nothing to nothing do to with powering through something or achieving some goal. Um, it is absolutely about finding uh, peace uh, and finding contentment in the person of Jesus Christ in whatever situation that I'm in. And That's so it. Paul is saying, I know what it is to have food. I know what it is to be starving to death. I know, you know, how to, how to, and I've found contentment in any situation because I really don't, I mean, you know, I'm sure that Paul never wanted to be stoned. He never wanted to be beaten with rods. He never wanted to be shipwrecked. He never wanted to be left for dead. Yep. Mm-hmm. But he was. Yeah, he was actually like promoting losing. Well, and the, you know, that, I mean, that's not where the I winning. get to the end, yeah, right? <laughs> and but what he's saying, he says that my hope is not in the outcome of how the situation that I'm in is going to turn out. Right. My hope is that I'm safe in Jesus no matter how it turns out. Right. So to live as Christ and to die as gain. And so the idea that I am looking for for Christ's presence, his peace, his comfort in the midst of any situation, that's not where I place my hope. And so uh, we, the way we use it, um, the way we read that verse as we apply it to ourselves is that I am going to— um, win. I'm going to win. I'm going to yeah, do this. Conquer. But, I mean, I made the point that Jesus did not come to help us in our life. Mm. Jesus came to be our life. And the yeah. only way to life is through his death, burial, and resurrection. Resurrection life that Jesus offers is only available to those who have died. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and so I want, I want to be spiritual. Uh, I want the life that Jesus offers, but I don't want anything to do with his death. I don't want anything to do with his daily suffering, you know, um, that that would cause me to be spiritual and have his life made manifest in me. But isn't that what 1 Peter 1, the first section, was Uh saying about these trials coming and you're you're finding joy? Well, He starts talking about... Yeah. Rejoicing, even though you're suffering and you're having trials, and but right. it's just a subject that people, yeah, it's just not appealing. It, you know, when he's talking about the tested genuineness of your yeah. faith, who's who's determining that your faith needs to be tested? Who do you think's running that show? Well, it's not me, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad it's not. Yeah, it's the Lord. Yeah, and he is he is saying. I mean, I, I always hate that. It's like, uh, Lord, you know, I love you. I do, but just please don't ask me to prove it to you, you know? Yeah. But he is saying there's going to there's gonna be evidence in your life. The one who obeys my command is that is the one who loves me. Yeah. Uh, and there's and so if the one who denies themselves take up their cross, that's the one that's worthy of me. Mm-hmm. The ones who love me are the ones who do what I say. <clears throat> I don't care if you can quote it. I don't care if you can quote it in Greek. Yeah, you know, it's it's will you actually get up and do it? So whoever will get up, open the door, then I'm going to abide with them and them with me. So the name of the sermon was "Life Made Manifest." And before we go to overtime, would you read uh, Larry's Second Corinthians four eleven in your version? Because you use the ESV, right? Uh, what is not first? always. I've got the NIV in front of me. Okay, well, well yeah, well, read uh, read Second Corinthians four eleven because okay. I circled that as kind of the what I call the key text to me in your sermon okay. and uh, I want to discuss that a little bit in the overtime but I want you to read that cuz to remember where I where I did it here Here wait a minute I got it I'll read Okay it. Um second Second Corinthians 4:11 For we who are alive Oh yeah are always being given over to death for Jesus sake so that so that mm-hmm. and and I want to talk about that so that in the overtime so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body so then death is at work in you but life is at work 
in you. Exactly. We're being <clears throat> given over yeah. to death. Which is, and I want to talk about that uh, mm-hmm. a little bit in the overtime, that so that, because you made some really good points about that. So if you want to follow us over, hear a little more from our old friend LB hmm. from Oklahoma. It's blazetv.com slash unashamed uh, for our overtime segment. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.